Uh, my name is Wayne Brow. I'm the Program Director for Tech and Innovation here at R Street. Um, we wanted to open up a discussion today on, on the, the role of antitrust and, and big tech. It, it's an important issue. Um, there's a lot of different thinking on the issue. Um, so what I wanted to have an opportunity to do today is provide a number of different viewpoints. Um, so one of the things we did was reach, reach out to some of our friends in, in the Knight Research Network to get uh, different voices that we can bring into the conversation today. Um, and as, as, as a host, um, I want to pass the baton over to Brendan Bordelin, who will be our moderator. And he is, he's currently at he just joined Politico, I believe, and is, is, is running the Morning Tech. So I, I'm sure a lot of you are, are, are fans of uh, that, and, and as we are. And he, I think he just came over from National Journal, if I, if I, if I believe you were, you're doing your shoes there. But, but let, me, let me toss the baton over to you and, and uh, let's start the conversation. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Brendan Bordelon with Politico. Uh, I think it's my eighth week here. Uh, so I, I kind of do everything helming the, the morning tech newsletter, which I'm sure all of you subscribe to, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, really appreciate the chance to talk antitrust today. Um, obviously, a uh, pretty big deal. Um, I want to introduce the, the rest of the panelists. You guys uh, met Wayne already um, from R Street. Um, we're also going to be hearing from Mark Jameson. He's the uh, senior non-resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. We're going to hear from Karina Montoya. Uh, she's a uh, at the Center for Journalism and Liberty. Uh, she's a reporter there uh, at the Open Markets Institute. And then we have Diana Moss. Uh, she's the president of the American Antitrust Institute. Um, if I messed up any of your uh, uh, intros there, please uh, let, let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, let's just jump right into it. We're obviously going to have uh, some differing opinions here, and I think that's good. Uh, you know, obviously the antitrust debate is uh, it's this is pretty momentous period uh, for antitrust policy in the U.S., particularly from a tech context. Um, and I know that folks believe, you know, that this, the stakes are really high here. You know, if, if things get messed up one way or the other in terms of how the U.S. government, the federal government, goes at the antitrust debate as applied to these big tech platforms, Facebook, Google, Amazon, I think are probably the big three. Um, there's concern that it's going to impact the industry for a very long time uh, because the tech industry is so essential to the U.S. economy. Uh, that's going to have a major impact one way or another on the country and, and probably the, the entire world. So we can get into specific questions on the economics and, and jurisprudence of antitrust. And, and I want to get there, you know, talk about consumer harm. Uh, do we need to change the consumer welfare standard or, or just kind of adapt it to the new economic reality? Um, should antitrust law protect competitors and not just consumers. But before we do all that, I kind of want to flip things around and just start at the end of all this. Um, if things go the way that that you know you fear that they could, um, what does that mean for the tech industry? What does that mean for US consumers, for the American economy, for the world, you know, if we get this wrong, if we get this moment wrong? And I guess um, you know, we can we can start with Wayne if you want and, and maybe just we'll just kind of go down the line from there. Sure. I, I think, you know, antitrust policy is, is critical and it is at an important juncture right now. And if we get this wrong, I, I think we see um, a chance to impact innovation adversely, impact the consumer choice in the marketplace adversely, and it impact the, the, the growth of and, uh, the, the tech world as a whole. You know, we're, we're big fans of permissionless innovation and, and, and tech moves at a very fast pace. And if we end up in imposing new per se regulations that sort of restrict certain behaviors, I think we have a potential of really harming consumers at, at the end of the day. Um, and I'd rather, I'd rather avoid that by, by having an opportunity to let, uh, you know, as we have now a rule of reason to look at these things on a case by case basis and make sure um, we're allowing innovative things to go on but while we do have the existing antitrust laws to take care of any adverse or, or, or criminal behavior that, that's going on that, that does need to be addressed. But it is an impact on, on consumers and innovation that, that really worries me if we get this wrong. Okay, thanks. Uh, Karina, if you want to go, um, again, you know, this is kind of like your, your worst case or close to worst case. You know, reporters like to make things negative just right off the bat. So uh, yeah, if you just wanted to explain sort of where you feel like, you know, if, if we get this really wrong, how, how what the impact will be and, and, and what's at stake. Yes, for sure. So I want to start off my participation here, making it clear that I'm not an economist. I think my profile is a lot closer to Brandon's. I'm a journalist by profession. Most of my work has been uh, focused on covering financial markets, uh, business in general. I've also been on the PR side of some companies, and I sort of know the PR corporate ha handbook pretty well. 
Um, and I think for me, more than fearing, um, I think on the opposite side that if things continue as business as usual, we might actually end up, and I come from a perspective of a market that is specifically advertising in ad tech industry, which I'm most familiar with, we will end up continuing to have a basically a rigged market that is affecting specifically publishers, so who are actually the content creators and their ability to fairly monetize that content across the board. Right now, there's actually huge demand for provisions uh, that have to do with non-discrimination or, or self-preferencing as it is happening in the European Union. There's huge demand also for opening um, basically app stores or what the app stores markets is defined. I think right now there are large swaths of uh, startups, entrepreneurs and creators that feel that innovation is currently being stifled. That is what I've gathered uh, throughout my reporting in the US and abroad. So more than fear and I'm actually hoping that we get it right to create all of this. Um, positive effects that we are not seeing right now from the concentration of market power. Thanks, Karina. Uh, Mark, do you wanna go? Sure. What I, well, first, let me just thank you for including me in your, your event. I, it's quite an honor to be here. What I see going on is that we're wanting, a lot of people are wanting to keep the name antitrust, but do something completely different. And what they're wanting to do is move away from the idea that there's a problem sometimes with companies having market power and abusing that market power to damage competition, to damage customers. And I did say, if, if you are such a successful company that you get this big, we're gonna cut you down. And if you create an ecosystem that customers absolutely love, they all flock to it, we're gonna cut you down. And it's, it's, so it's taking something that people have found to be quite valuable and trying to turn it on its head. So what then happens? Well, if you're a customer that really has valued all the innovations that Amazon and Spotify and, and Google have made over the past few years that really got much part of big parts of the world through the pandemic, um, that may not be around for the next problem that we have. It, they're just not gonna be able to respond that way. Uh, what we'll see instead, I'm afraid, is a politicization, a politicalization of antitrust where we make judgments. We like this company, we don't like that company. And then people go after the ones that they don't like and embrace and favor the ones that they do. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Dan, it looks like you're, you're ready to go, you're, you're up. Thanks, Brendan, and thanks to R Street for inviting um, me here to this discussion today. Um, so it's a good question. What do we, what do I fear? Well, right now, um, AAI is very concerned that the approach towards uh, addressing competition in digital tech is not a coherent approach. And what I mean by coherent is that it is a fundamentally a public policy issue. Uh, it goes to competition, it goes to innovation, it goes to the protection of consumers. Um, but it also is very much uh, a problem that uh, invokes the need for multiple tools. So obviously antitrust enforcement is in the toolkit, um, uh, forms of sector regulation, for example, access regulation to promote interoperability and non-discriminate, that's in the toolkit. Uh, how about privacy law? That should be in the toolkit. How about concerns about uh, workers? That should be in the toolkit. Intellectual property law. So it really is a public policy problem um, and really deserves the toolkit approach, but we're not getting that. We're seeing antitrust being tasked with things for which it was not designed or intended. Um, we see really good empirical research coming out of AAI, uh, major research on uh, the unique features of digital business ecosystems, the market failures that pervade them which make a really, really good case for, for, for taking a look at potential uh, access uh, regulation, not talking about uh, natural monopoly regulation, talking about access regulation. So uh, long story short, we don't have a coherent approach. And I think we stand to end up with a very balkanized system that really uh, fails to get at the heart of the problem, but, but also sucks up an enormous amount of resources that could also be spent looking at the enormous number of competitive problems in other sectors of the economy, food and agriculture, healthcare, et cetera. 
Great. Uh, thanks, guys. I uh, appreciate everybody kind of going down the line there. Um, I, I want to, uh, you know, start out at sort of like the bedrock, one of the bedrock issues that I think is facing um, antitrust enforcers, people talking about this debate, uh, people trying to sort of like carve a path forward in Congress and at the agencies. Uh, and that has to do with uh, the consumer welfare standard uh, and the issue of price uh, around that. Um, in the past, you know, the way that the antitrust system generally worked, and I'm sure the, the experts are going to have, uh, you know, very uh, intricate thoughts about this, but, you know, generally, I think the sense was, you know, you had this standard of, of harm where a judge would have to say, okay, it's okay, you know, you can find market concentration in an industry, but it's not enough to just say that the concentration by itself is the problem, right? You have to also prove that consumers are being harmed by that concentration. And, for decades, the way that that was proven was through an increase in price, right? So if the market gets too concentrated, uh, consumers start paying more money. If you can prove that in court, uh, you have a good antitrust case. This is obviously a, a difficult situation uh, to, to, do, to apply to the tech companies because in many cases, these are unpriced services, right? Nobody's paying to, to use Google. Nobody's paying to use Facebook or Instagram. Nobody's paying to use Amazon if you're not on Prime, right? Because uh, the, the, they make money off advertisements, they make money off the data that you collect um, at the you know, point of sale or the point of use, there's no, there's no payment. So that has been a difficult thing for, I think, courts to deal with. It's been a difficult thing for folks in this industry, you know, in, in the, the antitrust debate to deal with. So I, I want to ask you guys, you know, whether you sort of feel like there is a path forward under existing law to to make these antitrust cases when the the unpriced aspect of these services remains, you know, so sort of center to the debate? Like, is there a way around this sort of thorny problem? Uh, you know, what have you guys thought about this? Uh, I, I imagine the answers will be quite different. So whoever wants to sort of jump in first and, and we can kind of go around. Well, I can jump in first. Um, I, we have a, a system right now that's very learning oriented. It's always building knowledge. It's always gaining expertise. And, and I think that has served us quite well because the, if you look back at how we did things in the 1950s and the 1960s, we've come a long ways. Uh, our level of sophistication is much, much greater than it used to be. The, the idea that um, the economy is all about consumers is an old idea, and I think it's the correct one for antitrust. I do think it's been applied, uh, excuse me, applied quite poorly. My understanding is that there are some people who believe that that is only a price issue, and it's certainly not. Uh, there's great variation in what customers experience and what they use. And, and so you want to bring that full richness into it. And that then deals with the issue that some people have that, uh, you know, I don't pay Facebook to, uh, you know, to use it, but somebody else does. Facebook makes a lot of money and they make it because somebody is paying those bills. And that is a part where some of that, that economic harm can, can happen, but it also happened to me as well. Uh, so it's, it's not a situation where we need to throw out consumer welfare standard because it zeroes in just on price. That's really poor economics. I've met people who do that, um, but they, they've not been right in doing that. Brendan, I'm, ha I'm happy to jump in next. Um, so so I, I think it's really important to sort of unpack this into two major parts. We have a, a standard, uh, the consumer welfare standard. Uh, the consumer welfare standard is just fine. Um, it is actually quite a broad and flexible standard to apply to capture uh, the harms from anti-competitive effects of mergers or conduct, right? Um, the consumer welfare standard can get to price effects. It can get to non-price effects like on quality, variety, service, innovation. Uh, it can address harms uh, in any part of the supply chain, in an input market, including labor, and in an output market, or any market in between. And it can certainly address uh, market power issues on the buy side and the sell side. The, the standard really is quite, um, is quite adequate. Uh, unfortunately, early in this conversation, ideological conversation about antitrust uh, and the role of antitrust, um, the, a lot of information came out from, from certain advocates uh, alleging that the consumer welfare standard could only reach to price effects. And that is just patently untrue. We've had a lot of antitrust cases that reach to non-price effects uh, of innovation v. Supplied. Um, we've looked at Tokyo Electron. These are all innovation-based cases. Um, so that was really unfortunate and unfortunate misinformation. And I think the other part of it is the, the, the problem isn't the standard. It's how the courts 
have been led to interpret the standard by very narrow um, analysis and, and um, poor evidence and, and too much focus on uh, certain things. So, so I allege, for example, that the problem isn't the standard, it's the ridiculously high burdens of proof on plaintiffs that exist today. Um, you can't go in uh, and prove that a merger will harm competition because a merger has not yet occurred. There has to be a high likelihood that harm will occur. Um, the standards are ridiculously high. Monopolization standards are, are almost uh, uh, insurmountable at this point. And there's a, there's a deep asymmetry in how uh, the courts have interpreted merger, say merger specific uh, efficiencies, given them far more deference than, um, than they should be getting in the context of anti-competitive harms. And a lot of this is the result of, um, is of early conservative Chicago school thinking that has gotten our system into, into the place where it is now. I appreciate that point, and I, I do want to give uh, both Wayne and Karina the chance to potentially respond. But you know, it does sound like then there's this sense that the the law itself can can very much uh, you know encompass things beyond price. Um, but uh, the judiciary has sort of limited itself uh, over time. A jurisprudence starts to stack up. Um, it would very well taken that price has not been the only thing that has come across, you know, uh, these, these antitrust cases, there have been examples where consumer welfare has extended beyond that. But how do you, how, and this is to anybody, how do you fix that situation? I mean, if the law as it is uh, would work, but, you know, judges aren't interpreting it appropriately, does, it, does the law need to be changed? Do you need to sort of more directly go to the judges and say, you know, this is how you should look at this? Or, or what, what is, uh, what's, what's everybody's thoughts on that? But I, I can jump in there. And, and I, I think the one of the things that, that I like about the consumer welfare standard is it, it does have the flexibility to, to do all of these things. It, it look beyond price and, and, and provide a, sort of a rationale for, for looking at antitrust uh, consumer harms or anti-competitive harms, whatever you want to look at. Um, and it, if you sort of look at what the alternative was and, and what some of the new uh, legislation that's being proposed thinks about, are these per se standards that are they're not really based on, on sort of much uh, economic analysis behind them. Um, you're, you're setting these bright lines. For instance, if you're a company over 550 billion, suddenly this applies to you. But you know, if you're talking about a company that's 400 billion versus 500 billion, it, you know, the, there's not a lot of difference in, in, in terms of size and in terms of potential market power. Um, so if, if you go to this bright line approach, and this is what we had before, you know, the other side of the consumer welfare standard is when, as that came aboard, the economic approach to analyzing any trust was changing as well, because we had these old structure conduct performance models where you looked at the structure of the firm and, you know, how many firms in the industry, and you come up with these concentration ratios and, and then, you know, you could see performance, which was profit, but this, this middle, the conduct in the middle was always sort of assumed. It's hard to measure. You couldn't really find a good analysis of it. So you assumed if, if it's a, you know, small number of firms, they're making a lot of profit, there's something potentially adverse and, and anti-competitive that's going on. Um, so so the, when we switched to a consumer welfare standard, we sort of dropped that approach. And, and, and I think it, it's, you know, antitrust law and industrial organization, it's messy. You have to get into the details. You have to do the empirical work to find out what's going on. And I think having uh, an approach where we look at it case by case with a rule of reason and, and a, a consumer welfare standard is going to be better than attempting to try, try for an agency or a court to set bright lines on, on how things go. And it goes across all industries, it goes across um, you know, sectors, you know, that's, a, that's much more problematic. So I think there's a lot of benefits to using the consumer welfare standard. Um, and, you know, the, maybe, you know, obviously it, it may take some refining and, and that's, you know, how to get the courts to make those changes. That's a challenge because I, you know, the courts, you know, as it is, you know, there, there is a potential to use antitrust law as a competitive weapon. If you're a rival, you're not necessarily interested in consumer welfare. You're interested in, in pushing a rival company out of the market. And unfortunately, those kinds of cases um, sort of distort the law in ways that um, it's not in the public interest. It's very sort of private, private self-interest driven. So, so it's a challenge, but I, I think the, stand, the framework we have is probably a bit the best we're going to get. Great, uh, appreciate. It. Oh, go ahead, Karina. Go ahead. Yes, for sure. Um, 
I think I like to bring up two things. Um, the first one is that there is an issue in the digital markets as they are set up right now of transparency and also of regulation of data privacy protections more specifically in the US, which is one of the countries that lacks of a federal um, data privacy law. Um, that's, on, that's one part of what I want to explain and then I'll pivot to how the advertising market is working. I think it's a good example of the complexity of analyzing whether there are anti-competitive behaviors happening there or not. But the second point that I wanted to make is that I do think um, there is evidence of how the consumer welfare framework has worked. And I like to refer to the work of Professor John Cuocas, who actually has a book on antitrust and, and competition policy, where he analyzed about close to 200 products before merger, mergers and after mergers, including joint ventures. And I think the result of that was basically the prices rose for nearly two thirds of those products. For one third of those products, actually the price increase was more than 10% or the same. And for one in out of five products, it was close to 20% of increase. So I think there is a question here as to whether exactly, um, how exactly um, the consumer has benefited from the approach that, we, that we've been having throughout you know, the last 20 years or so in the US when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. And then the second point um, that I want to make that it has to do specifically with the advertising market is that there's currently a lot of conflict of interest that I think are going, um, I'd say they're not being like properly discussed. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you a specific example of Google who's actually facing uh, lawsuits, antitrust lawsuits in the US, uh, a big one that's led by the Texas Attorney General, and another one also, at, um, if I'm not mistaken, at the UK level of the Competition and Markets Authority is looking into the same issue, which is basically that you have a market which is called the um, um, real-time bidding market where all of us have profiles that actually are supposed to be valued at some pricing point for um, advertisers to put or at, uh, to place advertising on publishers. And we have a structure currently, and you, know, you can look for everything that's been documented about it, where one player is the ad exchange, it represents the publisher, it represents the advertiser, it represents the, um, um, basically the algorithmic methodology that defines those prizes. And at the same time, they also compete against the people that they represent in the same platform for uh, advertising of their own products. So how do you really evaluate or how do you assess, how do you apply this framework is my question when you have a market that works like this. And if you do, um, I guess, um, if you draw the line, if you wanna draw similarities, it is basically as if you had, I don't know, Goldman Sachs or Citibank or any bank in the US owning the New York Stock Exchange, just to draw from my perspective of covering financial markets. So I, I think the structure of the market itself needs to be more discussed um, beyond pricing at this point of, of the discussion. That's my take. Yeah. Appreciate Can I pick it. up on something she was saying and something that Diane was talking about earlier as, as well? Sure, jump in quick and then yeah. And, and it has to do with the question you asked earlier, which is, well, what, what should we really do um, with the antitrust laws that we have? And as I, I think about the answers they were giving, and I'll, actually, Brandon, I'll, I'll start out by picking on you. You talked about market concentration, whereas Diane talked about uh, monopolization and I talked about market power. And it's actually the latter two that we're worried about about in antitrust. We're worried about companies that can avoid competition. That's what monopoly power, market power, and such is all about, avoiding competition. Big if concentration is just a measure of success, whether it's illicit success or you, because you're doing a really amazing job. Politico has great market share in its space. That's because it's good. Diane's organization is unique, has great market share in its space. That's because it's good. Same as for Karina's organization as well. That's a good thing. So we don't want to worry about market concentration. What we want to worry about is, is someone able to avoid competition? And that's where I would like to see um, antitrust policy go. Try to dig in and see what is it that holds back competition from being able to do something. 
not about the good qualities of the, the successful companies, but is there something that keeps people from jumping to the next generation of products or to at least innovate laterally um, away from this particular product that's having great success today? If there's something holding back, that's what antitrust should go after. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. And I think, you know, both you and Karina are kind of getting at the question I was going to ask next, which is, um, you know, we talked about the consumer welfare standard of antitrust. It sounds like everybody is broadly on board with the concept of, you know, focusing consumers uh, on, you know, focusing on the potential harm to consumers when we look at uh, antitrust action, uh, particularly applied to the big tech companies. So let's, and again, you guys both kind of mentioned this, but let's get into it. Uh, do we feel like consumers are now being harmed uh, as a result of the market power, not market country, market power uh, of these big platforms? Um, you know, some folks say, I'm going to let you guys say, but, you know, just broadly, some folks say that choices are limited for consumers in some other ways. Other people say, and, uh, you know, uh, I think you were getting to this, Mark, um, the network effects of these large platforms are actually inherently good for consumers. There's a lot of wrinkles there. Um what what does everybody sort of believe in terms of of whether these market the market power of some of these firms is is inherently bad for consumers or or actually has some benefits? Well, I, I'm happy to chime in on that. So um, you know, details are really important here. Uh, it depends. You know, who's the consumer? Is it the user uh, who engages with a digital platform, uh, whether it be e-commerce or uh, online dating or search or or whatever? There's so many different types of platforms. Or is the consumer the advertiser, for example? Advertisers absolutely can be harmed, and those can be pecuniary damages that, that accrue to advertisers from anti-competitive conduct. If you're, if you're talking more about the end-use consumer, which is the user, um, uh, users engage with digital ecosystems in really weird ways. Um, they behave uh, uh, not, not in a rational way. They give out more of their data than they, than they uh, than they would if they had good information about how their data was being used, collected, processed using cloud infrastructure and deployed and monetized. And, and so it's, it's a bit of a mess. There are a lot of market failures in the digital ecosystems. There are network effects like we've already heard about, tipping to a single platform. There are uh, data externalities, little data goes a long way. Um, there are information asymmetries around how consumers behave in regard to giving information and their privacy. Um, there are enormous economies of scale and scope and cloud infrastructure. So once you put a user into this mosh pit of, of this very complex business model and, and market failures, um, you, you know, the major harm comes through a degraded user experience. And that translates primarily into abuses of privacy. And remember the digital ecosystems run on data. That is the gasoline of the ecosystem. And so there are strong incentives that are tied to the value proposition to misuse, appropriate, violate privacy, um, because that's, that's the value proposition. It's to take data and to monetize it, right? And that is the source of the market power in the digital platforms. So, so yeah, it's a non-price effect. It comes out in quality and, and privacy, but we have antitrust cases that allege that, right? Look at the Facebook cases, uh, federal, state level. That's pretty clear. And so, yes, a judge absolutely will be confronted with a theory of harm around adverse effects on the quality of user engagement well within the context of the consumer welfare standard. But my point, and I'll, I'll finish up quickly, is you, you know, this is a big market power problem that we see. And the question is, what's the best tool or combination of tools to address it? absolutely need stronger antitrust enforcement. We need legislation to strengthen, clarify, modernize the laws. Um, but we should also be thinking like, like they are in the UK about a system of oversight, regulatory oversight, not carried out by antitrust enforcers and not making antitrust enforcers into quasi regulators, but to address these market failures and underlying economic phenomenon in the digital ecosystems that are the source of the market power. I'm a former sec federal regulator, so this is near and dear to my heart. That is not being considered in the United States today, a dual system of stronger enforcement and uh, appropriate, appropriate uh, sector regulation. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and I'm hoping I actually I could kick that question over to folks on the more sort of libertarian side of this question. Um, you know, Diana is making the point, I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure I frame it correctly, but it sounds like, you know, antitrust is a tool to go at these problems, but it's not the tool, it's certainly not the only tool that people should be looking at. Um, are, would you guys be open to some sort of digital regulator like Diana uh, suggested? Would that be a better way to approach some of the problems that I think uh, folks on all sides, honestly, in all, in all political parties certainly are seeking to address right now, as opposed to using antitrust as that hammer, would it be better to empower the FTC to be, you know, uh, I know it is now, but, you know, really boost it up to be like the nation's premier digital privacy or digital regulator. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that, on that as a possible uh, pathway? I'll let Wayne go first on that. Sorry, I was trying to find my mute button there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I, I think what Diana said earlier about the, you know, the, the toolbox of, that we have, um, antitrust is basically about the allocation of, of resources. You know, a lot of these other questions that, that come into, you know, the antitrust laws push for allocative efficiency. That's ideally in, in the economist world, we want to make sure that resources go where they should at the, at the lowest price. Um, but some of these other questions uh, like privacy or, or, you know, data security, those are all legitimate issues. Um, are they any trust issues? Um, I don't think so. There, there are probably other parts of the toolbox that, 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 that Diana mentioned. And I think we should pay heed to those. Whether we need to create a, a new regulatory oversight to do that, I, I'm, I'd probably be a little bit more skeptical of doing that. Um, but I, I think we do have laws on the books and we do have uh, enforcement agencies that can address those questions. But I think to be effective, they shouldn't be bundled in with the question of, of antitrust. They're, they're important questions and they have significant impacts on consumers, um, but they're not questions of resource allocation. And, and I think that's, that's sort of the difference I see. I see. Yeah, and I can jump in on that as well. Um, on the question of do we need a digital regulator, I'm very skeptical of that because I don't know the boundaries of that regulator. As the world becomes more and more digital, does it just regulate everything? And do we regulate all companies just because they use roads? You know, it's a, no, we, we might regulate roads, but we don't necessarily regulate somebody because they use roads. We're going to regulate you this way. I, it just doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, but I, I'll, I can be corrected. I'll figure that out maybe down the road a little bit. I wanted to get back to the question you had earlier about um, am I concerned about market power for the, the current big tech companies? And actually, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that they have market power. And let me just explain why. So you take the, the current uh, case that the Federal Trade Commission has filed against Facebook, for example, claiming that it has 60% of social media market. But if you look at the, the instead of counting heads of people who are signed up and understand that the average American consumer has like seven different social media accounts and you count the amount of time they spend on them, then Facebook has about an 8% share of that space. So that's, it's, you know, market share and market power aren't the same thing. And we've had very small firms with market power because they controlled cartels, but 8% uh, is a pretty tough sell um, for having market power. As I look at the different companies, they've had a lot of competition coming towards them. Uh, talked about earlier, Shopify, it is making great ground on Amazon. Uh, TikTok is now, what, about a third the size in terms of number of customers as Facebook and six, seven years ago didn't even exist. Um, competition is, is doing a lot of the things that people would like for antitrust to do, and it should. Thanks. And oh, sorry, Karina, do you want to? Yeah, jump in? I think I'll just jump in the question of how users are being harmed. And I think it is a valid point when we want to first think of who are we really talking about, right? So I will think I will refer to like the user just like, I guess myself, <laughs> or you, Brendan, all of us just using these services. And I think that because of the way the advertising, the uh, digital advertising market is a structure, and I'm going back to that point because really this is the way how platforms are making um, profits. Um, there's really like an opportunity cost that users cannot really know at this point how, exactly how they are, um, you know, being harmed because the way, for example, let's just take the example of search engines, right? So there is a really big case of self-preferencing that Google lost uh, the EU court, I think it was earlier this year, um, basically where 
um, it was proven that, you know, they were leveraging the algorithms in a way that they could place or preference, put preference in the, the rankings of products that they themselves were commercializing, right? So how do I ever know if I, you know, went over to choose a product based on my trust on the, of the search engine and the ranking algorithm, and then it turns out that I was being deceived, right? So that's, that's on one part of, I guess, the question then, specifically in the market of um, digital advertising, when you have clients, advertisers, and you have the publishers, Publishers right now, I mean, um, sorry, advertisers right now might think that they're also getting the best deal because the promise of uh, digital advertising, especially specifically in programmatic advertising, is like the more scalable um, the website or the publisher is, then the advertiser will reach more people. And there's this really interesting book. Um, let me just find it over here. I think it's Subprime, uh, Subprime Attention Prices. When they bring this interesting case that I think is very illustrative of, of, of the of the problem here. In 2017, Procter & Gamble, who's actually one of the biggest um, advertisers online, they basically cut around 200 million of their budget on digital advertising because they were afraid of fraud that was happening in um, that uh, specific uh, market and also about the safety of their brand because what currently happens is that a lot of this advertise, advertisement is being placed in websites that either spread misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, and the advertisers have no control of it. So after cutting down that 20 million budget of their advertising um, strategy, they actually reinvested that to other channels, including radio, television, and they increased their branding exposure by 10%. So I think there's really a case of, of harm that is happening, but as, a, as, as the market is set up right now and like the lock, the lack of enforcement and also of auditing of these algorithms does not allow us to see what the real harms are. And Kareem is making an excellent point on the, on the advertising, that if there's fraud going on, we have tools for dealing with fraud. Fraud isn't necessarily antitrust, but the Federal Trade Commission can do with, deal with fraud. And, and so that's really important. Um, some of the things that Diane was talking about falls into that space as well. Companies need to be honest with their, their customers, whoever those customers might be. Um, also in the advertising though, uh, the, the companies we have now have right now who are big in the advertising space, the big tech companies, mainly Google and Facebook, are facing a difficult situation going into the future. And it may be an opportunity for kind of the legacy journalism com uh, companies that used to be dominant in, in advertising. And that is we're moving into a decentralized space. We're moving into a space where ads are going to be three-dimensional and they're going to behave quite differently than they do today. And Facebook and Google aren't positioned to do to make that transition very well. They have to make a lot of changes to their businesses. And maybe they'll make it, maybe they won't. Businesses don't tend to make those transitions very well. But then that's the opportunity for the legacy journalism companies, that they, if, if they can move from being a kind of a standalone to, I can work with somebody in this whole kind of metaverse space, this decentralized space that's emerging and create something different, then they'll get back all that advertising that they had lost to, uh, to Facebook, Google at all. Great, thanks guys. And, and I really appreciate, you know, demarcating uh, when we talk about consumers, you know, who, who that is, because it's not just necessarily the user, you know, it is advertisers, it's folks sort of across the ecosystem and, and everybody's kind of got their, their differing uh, opinions on, on who's harmed and where and at what point in the chain. So I really appreciate that. I did want to turn um, uh, to mergers and acquisitions and discuss that a little bit. I also want to leave space for, for questions. Uh, so hopefully we can roll through this kind of quickly, but um, there, there's obviously a lot of this is wrapped up. Uh, this debate is wrapped up in, in uh, the the uh, this is reality, you know, the big tech companies very frequently will snap up uh, smaller companies. Uh, there's it's it's sort of seen in a lot of ways like an exit strategy for for smaller firms. Um, I think venture capitalists and uh, will often like invest in a company knowing that you know they're the way they're going to get out is in five years Google is going to buy them buy that company and then they're going to cash out. So there's a lot of I think concern on one end that that makes it harder for competitors to ever really rise to the level where they can challenge one of these big companies. And then I know folks on the other end will often say that, um, look, if you don't uh, if you don't let these mergers and acquisitions go forward, 
entrepreneurs might never get off the ground. They might have no reason to, to no incentive really to do this. So I, I want to, um, uh, you know, kick that to the panel. Um, where do you guys fall in the mergers and acquisition question? Uh, do you think it's something that we should start to rein in, or do you think it's something we should allow to continue? Uh, and again, sort of keeping consumers and the, the ecosystem in mind throughout. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to chime in on, on that. Um, again, a recent empirical work by AI shows that digital ecosystems grow primarily through acquisition. Um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acquisitions, many of which fall below the HSR reporting thresholds. Um, the, the top five themselves have made over 800 acquisitions. Um, I testified in the Senate to the fact that uh, only one acquisition of a nascent rival has been challenged by either the DOJ or the FTC, and that was Google ITA in about 2009. That brings the challenge rate of all cleared cases to either agency, uh, the, it brings the challenge rate in digital in, in, in the digital sector to about 1%, whereas the challenge rate across um, all sectors um, is about 15%. So very weak a record of enforcement, but a clear pattern that digital ecosystems grow through acquisition and they have um, pretty clear strategies that they will engage in serial acquisition to build out their ecosystems, fortify the platform, expand cloud infrastructure, add applications to the eco ecosystem. Um, we absolutely need more stronger merger enforcement. There's just no, there's no doubt about it. We need a, a presumption against um, acquisitions of nascent rivals. We don't have that. Hopefully that will come through in the comments on the current merger RFI that's, that, that's out there. And the deadline was just extended another month uh, for those who wanna comment. So we also need more challenges of consummated deals, right? That's a good way to strengthen antitrust enforcement, you know, is, is bringing more section seven challenges. I'm glad you brought that up uh, because I, I did want to kick that to specifically the other side of the panel. Um, retroactive merger enforcement, uh, it does look like something that the the FTC in particular under the new leadership of Lena Khan is, is taking a pretty close look at. Do uh, you guys have thoughts on that? Um, any concerns uh, about how that is being structured, how that's being set up? probably for Mark or, or Wayne, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I do have some concerns about that. I mean, because it, it adds a degree of uncertainty to the marketplace that, that sort of ruffles the, the, the innovation process. If in fact, you know, um, you know, if, if you're a startup and you get, you see your acquisition and you're, you're done and then suddenly um, your, your acquisition is being reviewed, the incentive to, for, to make those acquisitions goes down and there's a potential harm for, for you know, nascent innovators to be able to make that crossover to provide the, the products that, that consumers like. You know, there's, there's not a lot of demonstration of consumer harm in all of this. Um, and so I, I think at the end of the day, um, I'd be very skeptical about uh, setting up a retroactive review of, of some of these, uh, these mergers and even, even sort of putting bright lines in, in, in the existing law for say larger firms that that are not allowed to make these mergers or, or acquisitions um, down down the road. So I, I, I'm think I'm confident that the you know the what we have in place now works, and the, the fact that there's innovation occurring, the fact that there's consumers benefiting, without uh, measures of, of significant harms, I would say makes me let want to stay within the current framework rather than try to to put new things in place. Brendan, can I can I just jump in really really quickly? Um, yeah. Uh, I, based on what Wayne Wayne just said, I, I'm not talking about sort of a systematic uh, effort to to review every single transaction that ever went down. We're I'm talking about consummated Section Seven challenges based on evidence of adverse effect. Higher prices, lower quality, less innovation. That is a good use of antitrust resources. It is not a particularly good use of resources to review every single transaction that ever occurred, right? Since the beginning of time. So the agencies couldn't possibly do that. Like it would prevent them from enforcing the antitrust laws. So that's a really important um, uh, qualification, but it also hooks in to your original question, which is, well, what do we wanna do with this VC backed startup model? Should we, should we bow to it? Should we defer to it and hands off and gosh, don't wanna kill the goose that laid the golden egg. And the concern there is, Antitrust has never deferred to any particular model 
a business model of innovation, never. Antitrust should be uh, neutral to whatever model of innovation firms choose to use. In fact, you want uh, dynamism and competition on innovation. And so, you know, deferring to the VC backed, you know, startup model is a recipe for continuing the kind of serial acquisition and, and uh, market power concerns that we see now. Let me add to what Diane was just talking about. I, I think uh, she has a lot of really good points about how, especially in the tech industry, the, the markets, I, call, I think of it as a market for ideas as opposed to a market for, for companies. Um, it's, it's just different than any place else. Shane Greenstein at Harvard did a really good study on this on the hardware side of the tech sector and found that the, the acquisitions in the tech sector hardware side was more about acquiring ideas than acquiring companies. And I think that is true in the, the more software oriented businesses as well. And that's why we have this situation where you've got the 15% the versus the 1% that she was talking about. Um, so, it, so think about it, might think about it this way, you know, everybody here is a writer and a publisher and just think about what if, if you wanted to publish a book, um, if you had to figure out not just, oh, I can write this book, but you had to figure out how to bind it and you had to figure out how to market it and, and all of those things, how difficult that would be. But if you can just have the idea and somebody else can take it and carry it the rest of the way, then you're more likely to write a lot of books. My, one of my sisters is a well-published author and one of her most successful books, one of the distributors actually bought rights to the book and really sold a lot of them because it was really good at that. And as an author, that's not necessarily her talent. So if you've got the great idea and you can turn it into a product, but you just can't build a business around it, somebody else can and, and should have that opportunity as the customers will benefit if it's done well. Great. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And, and I do, uh, I, I really like that back and forth. I do want to get to questions because uh, we are sort of running up on time uh, and I want to at least get to like a couple. So um, hopefully we can uh, keep the answers a little bit brief. Um, and uh, Diana, you had mentioned innovation and I've been talking about innovation this entire time. Uh, there's a good question here um, regarding, uh, I just want to know what folks think generally about the impact of innovation and research, uh, you know, the development pursuits from these big tech companies, if they were to be structurally reformed, what would that do to uh, the R&D investments they put in? Um, you guys are probably following the competitiveness package that's moving through Capitol Hill right now, both the House and Senate, there's a big discussion about, you know, boosting American R&D, particularly to sort of compete against China. Um, and I, you know, I don't think it's a secret. The tech platforms have been out there pretty aggressively arguing that the antitrust efforts would undercut that capability because uh, they would have less money to invest in research. And a lot of the private sector, a lot of the U.S. research comes out of the private sector. So um, I, from both sides, you know, what, what is the impact of um, antitrust or, or potential antitrust effects on that, uh, on that effort? Well, I would say that, um, yes, the, the, the large tech companies have very large R&D budgets. And um, if you start restructuring them, does that budget just get divided up or does it actually shrink as you start restructuring these firms? Uh, and that's that would be the concern I would have um, in term, with respect to innovation in terms of restructuring a, a large tech company. It's not necessarily clear whether the, the research budget maintains its, its levels once, once the company is, is restructured. So, so that would be a concern. Um, but, the, but there are other things that, you know, that, that go into innovation that I think are important that could be looked at. And one is, you know, the impact of the you know, intellectual property laws and, and how are they promoting innovation or, or are they harming innovation? I, I think there's some real concerns there um, that we could look at um, and are part of this process of, of looking at our innovation and looking at big tech and, and looking at, the, at their, their power. And, and if, if we have everything in place and the intellectual property laws are doing the right things and even small companies can have the ability to, to get into those markets, be it through starting their own company or through the merger and acquisition process. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think we do have to be, be careful about you know, restructuring budget, uh, restructuring these companies and, and what the potential impact would be on their, their R&D efforts. Brendan, I, I saw that question in the chat. It's a really, really good question. And I, I guess another angle on it um, uh, is what, what happens when you break off a platform from affiliated businesses or vice versa, right? What, what about these breakup, proposed breakup remedies, whether they be legislated or they be, you know, come out of some sort of antitrust enforcement action? And the platforms will always argue, as any 
controller of a large monopoly network will argue that if you force them to sell off their affiliated businesses, they will lose their incentive to innovate, right? And and so you know that's a that's a, a, a that's an economic question. Uh, how does that? How would a breakup like that affect incentives to innovate? The other side of the story, though, is um, if they are allowed to continue to discriminate against rivals operating on their platforms, third-party rivals, um, as we've seen across, you know, lots of complaints on that, uh, interoperability concerns, discrimination concerns, you know, not showing up in the buy box on Amazon unless you're a preferred provider, all that kind of stuff. Um, what does that do to innovation, right? That chokes off innovation by third-party rivals operating on a platform. So there's, you know, there there's this tension there between the innovation arguments. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I I do want to get to another question. I think I'm gonna kick it off to Karina. Can, actually, can I actually to... jump on that on that question? Um Very quickly, yes. If you go out there actually and talk to the people in Silicon Valley today that are trying to get their startups to be you know more visible or trying to reach out bigger audiences or that nobody over there if founders and funders are going to tell you uh, that they are scared of having a google or a facebook broken up because the reality right now is that they themselves don't know how to get around the grip of these companies in the market and to compete in a level playing field against them I want to bring that to the table because that is the reality that I'm observing. And also on the matter of mergers and acquisitions, um, I think that no, I, I don't know who is getting incentivized or disincentivized um, in this market when really nobody aspires anymore to either be a Google or a Facebook or, or being even acquired by these companies anymore. Um, and nobody is even like thinking, I believe, um, from what I've heard in the, the conversations I've had to even go against their, their specific core businesses because they know, you know, they will be barred from it. So I think the question is really whose innovation are we going to crush? Is it, are we concerned that we're just not going to be getting the same level of research of, uh, or new products from Google or from Facebook, from Amazon? Or are we worried about having new products and new ideas coming up in the market that are currently nobody knows because they're just unable to circumvent the, the rules of the game that have been set up by these companies. And it's in a market that really, if you look at the history of the internet and in its, in its commercialization as an infrastructure was never really fully regulated. So I would, I would add that. Yeah, I appreciate that, and and I wanna I wanna move to to at least get one more question in before uh, time, and it, there's a couple that that sort of the questions that that hint at this or or sort of poke at this uh, the the interplay between democracy and and market power uh, antitrust um, wh whether that's a pr appropriate tool and and whether we should sort of look at uh, potential harms to you know the fundamental sort of structure of American democracy. Um, you know, I think there are concerns in terms of like uh, somebody mentioned undermining the free press, the economic foundations of a free press because of the the advertising model that these companies have raised. Um, other people talking about sort of like the history of the Sherman Act and and whether there was some sort of like underpinnings there about protecting democracy. Um, what what do people think about that? I mean, is this is antitrust an appropriate tool to to address that issue? I mean, should we even be sort of talking about these things uh, uh, in the same vein, or, or are they or, or are they sort of <laughs> you know, different. I think antitrust starts looking like a, a tool you would use for something like that. If you have a kind of ending, end of history view of the world, that these companies are here to stay for a very, very, very long time. And, and I don't think that's the case at all. We've seen some significant changes in technology that really underlying their underlying, excuse me, undermining their business models. Um, so I, I don't worry about that very much. Where I think I, I worry more about economic power and, and political power keep becoming intertwined is, is when you have a lot of regulation. Antitrust is a form of regulation, but that's not the, the right form, quite the right form for this. When you have a lot of regulation in an industry, because the research has shown that the more regulated an industry is, the larger the firms become. And then the large firms stick around for a longer time because the government tends to protect 
those companies from competition. That's how they set up, that's how the companies advocate for regulation. Facebook advocates for regulation. And, it's, and I'd be suspicious that, that it's doing that in order to kind of keep competition out. So I would think that the causation might run the other direction. So I'd be really skeptical of saying that, oh, well, we will have greater political involvement um, if we just break up companies and regulate them more heavily. Yeah, really quickly, Brendan, I think um, at, competition is, is vital to a market-based economy and um, uh, vigorous antitrust enforcement is vital to promoting competition and the democratic principles that underpin markets, Contra uh, entrepreneurial freedoms, consumer freedoms. So, so yeah, there, there are obviously a lot of linkages in there. Um, I, I think it's a lot, and, and this is sort of where this whole debate got off onto the wrong track, was, was to assume that the antitrust laws um, are the tip of the spear in promoting democracy. Um, what about campaign finance reform? Hmm, that might be a really good thing to look at. What about tax policy? That might be a really good policy instrument to, to look at. So yeah, yeah, it plays a very, very important role in promoting markets and democratic principles. But again, let's go back to the toolkit approach. Let's find the best tools to achieve the goals that we want to achieve and the right mix of tools. Because, you know, as a as a progressive advocate, um, antitrust will play a very important role in that toolkit. Yeah. Got it. Uh, go ahead, Wayne. Yeah, no, I was just going to add to that that, yeah, I mean, there's a there's an important distinction we have to make between the, the normative values and, and the sort of the positive analysis that that's required here. And then, you know, historically, going back to the Sherman Act, there's always been sort of these normative views that big is bad, that antitrust is, is, is there to address these and, you know, the protect the agrarian interests in America. So, so these arguments about democracy and antitrust are, are not new. They go back to the beginning. But I, I think to, to do things right, we have to look at the positive analysis of what these laws are doing. Do they do the economic research, do the analysis. Um, and you'll find, I mean, there's other, in, the institutions surrounding antitrust are, are not just it, the public interest. You have you have Congress having a play in this. You have the judiciary. You have private companies that use the, the laws for their own, own benefits. So when you're looking at what you want to do with antitrust laws, I think it, it it's important to go back and do the economic research and find out how they work. And and in that sense, you know, the, the link between antitrust and, and democracy is probably not as as as, an, as strong as as some people make it out. I, I think we have to view antitrust as a way to improve allocated efficiency, and that just requires economic analysis to make sure that all the institutions involved, uh, we can see the impact of all of them in, in terms of what happens with antitrust law. Appreciate that. And uh, I, um, I, uh, I, we're probably going to run over time here, but I do want to get one more question really quickly, and, and that's just, because uh, I think it's a good one, um, that's just thoughts around the room on uh, particularly the Senate's antitrust package. Uh, so that's the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act uh, being pushed by Senator Amy Klobuchar. There's a lot of Republican buy-in on that as well. Um, what do folks think is going to happen this year, I guess, is a good question. And, uh, you know, do you think that there needs to be significant changes to that legislation if it is going to get across the finish line uh, or, or some other sort of, you know, shift in, in the current uh, dynamic on that on that bill? I, I can go first on that. Uh, I'm not going to try and read the political tea leaves to say what's going to happen or not going to happen in Congress. Uh, that, that's way beyond what an economist should ever try to do. I am very skeptical of what the, those bills try to do. Uh, they, they try to, to you know, like I said before at the start, they try to take the word antitrust and change its definition for some other end. I don't know what the other end is, but it's certainly not trying to improve the economy. Or if they think they're improving the economy, they've gotten it badly wrong. Yeah, I, I would just add to that um, on the political side that the, the single tenuous thread that holds uh, GOP support in on those bills is the free speech issues that arose in the 2020 elections and this, which are really at heart section 230 issues, right? That's a very slim, slim thread to, to garner by bipartisan support. My, my other, and then, you know, make, make of that what you will, um, my other comment is uh, in targeting just the top four firms and turning the FTC into a quasi sector regulator um, that will take resources away from the FTC to engage in antitrust enforcement. Um, but you're also missing potentially a whole swath of digital ecosystems that are growing fast. They're growing faster acquisition. Uh, we've done the empirical work on this Salesforce, Intuit, 
uh, Adobe. I mean, these are up and coming firms. They're, they're you know, two to 300 mi- uh, billion in market cap. They fall below the thresholds. They are acquiring their way to uh, be the next generation of dominant firms. They may be in specific applications or sectors, but what, what about those firms? Yeah. Just a quick... Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick comment on, on those bills. Um, I think I would just say from a global, a global perspective, because the US is not the only market that is working on this type of ex ante, if you wanna call it that way, um, tools um, to give better guidance of what practices are accepted and not in, in the digital markets. We have the uh, example of the European Union and they're coming up with an even more stricter um, law and in particular, I think for the non-discrimination bill, what I've been able to look at is that they do include um, non-publicly traded companies and publicly traded companies. So I think it's more overarching and not only just targeting uh, a few or a handful of companies as I think it's 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 been sort of like the emphasis um, made. Uh, but also I think that uh, this, this um, discussion of, of this package of bills cannot be seen without a, a approach to privacy regulation. So I think with those, with that other leg, um, you know, it, it'll be, it'll be maybe more difficult to reshape the regulation in which, in, in ways that the American people will want to. So I would just guess, I guess I would highlight that the privacy optics of, of how the market is going to work is also very important. Then again, the Europeans are already considering that. Appreciate that. Wayne, uh, we're over time, so I'll very quickly give you the last word on this. Okay, uh, I, I would just uh, say, just with respect to the bipartisan support, I, I agree with Diana that the, it's it's tenuous and with midterm elections coming up, um, I think, and other issues like Supreme Court nominees, uh, whether they get to antitrust this year is, is questionable. Yeah, and, and, and safe to say next year, uh, this debate could look really different uh, on Capitol Hill, depending on uh, how things shake out. Well, um, guys, this was this was a very very interesting uh, and and I think effective panel in terms of you know laying out the different viewpoints here. Uh, really appreciate everybody uh, who who tuned in, and certainly uh, thanks to the panelists uh, for for coming out and and for our street and the night network for for putting this together. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I I yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, again, um, you know, I, I think that our streets can be holding another panel uh, down the line on this. So I would you know encourage everybody to 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 check that out when it happens. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me, and uh, yeah, hope hope we can. Uh, it, this debate's not going away anytime soon, so I'm sure we'll have a lot more discussions and um, opportunities to chat uh, down the line. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care.